I'm going to start out with a gospel reading today. And it's an iconic reading. I refer to it that way. Because it pertains very explicitly to all of us today. This gospel reading is really about us. And I'll explain it as I get into it. So listen closely. Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. Just a little footnote, this is very unusual. We hear Jesus talking to people that needed his help. We hear Jesus talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. And we hear Jesus talking to his disciples. But Martha and Mary, although Lazarus isn't in this story, he's the, their brother, they are his friends. So we get a, a little bit of an interesting insight. This is a gospel story is taking place among his friends. As I said to Swami, the people that he had cappuccino with every weekend and put his feet up. So Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me all by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, you kind of get the friendship piece of this. Martha, Martha, twice he says her name. You are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. I'm going to repeat that. There is need of only one thing. And Mary has chosen the better part. And I will not take it from her. Amen. So, <clears throat> one of my frustrations growing up in hearing this gospel proclaimed in, in church every couple of years is it was always presented in a dualistic way. And let me say what I mean by that. The priest preaching would always say, well, some of us are called to be Martha and some of us are called to be Mary. Some of us are called to serve and some of us are called to live a contemplative life. No, no, no. That's not what Jesus says. We're all called to live a contemplative life. If you're here in the Assisi Institute, you're practicing Kriya Yoga, you are a contemplative. Now, does that mean you won't do service? No. But don't look at this in a divisive, dualistic way. Yogananda said, there are some, but there are very few people, like 0.1% who are called to live in caves or in hermitages. Yogananda said the 99 plus were called to be contemplatives in the world. And this gospel passage is teaching us how to be a contemplative in the world. Now, some of you may be thinking, yeah, but who's going to do the work? Who's going to do the work? Dualistic thinking. Put it aside. Get rid of it. So let's look at Martha, because really there's two choices in front of us. Either we're going to be a Martha or a Mary. And if we're honest with the gospel passage, it ain't that great for Martha. Jesus says, you're worried. You're anxious about many things. It's not good to have our activity driven by anxiety and worry. Nothing good can come when our behavior is driven by anxiety and worry. Even when we're doing the right things, it won't produce the right fruit. Do you ever go to somebody's house for dinner? 
And they were irritated and rushed and anxious. And they were preparing the food, but they were irritated, rushed, and anxious. And the food maybe was good on a physical level, but you don't enjoy the meal. Because there's so much anxiety and worry and tension in the household. Versus when you go to somebody else's house and they welcome you. There's peace. There's love. You know, Vicki and I often make family Sunday dinner for our family together. And we'll have Bocelli playing in the background. And if I'm making my marinara sauce and I'm cutting the tomatoes, I literally, while I'm cutting the tomatoes, God, Christ, guru. God, Christ, guru. Bless the people who eat this food. May they feel your love pouring through the food. One kind of activity driven by anxiety and worry and the other activity driven by love, truth, beauty, and goodness. So we're all, again, we're all called to be a contemplative, meaning that we, that we nurture that union and that communion and that samadhi with God and guru. And we fulfill our duties, not either or, both and. So let me get into the story a little bit more. I want you to notice, Martha doesn't say to Jesus, do you want me to cook dinner? Do you want me to be involved in all of these things? She makes assumptions about what she's supposed to be doing, never checking in with him, the guest, her guru. Then you have Mary sitting at his feet, listening in a posture of openness, receptivity, quiet, stillness. Not so that she could do nothing, but to make sure that when she went into action, it was the right action, number one. Do you see the difference? And when she went into action, it was guided by love, grace, inspiration, not her nervousness and her anxiety. Mary was not a passive person. You look at the rest of the gospel. And most scripture scholars say this Mary is Mary Magdalene. Who was at the foot of the cross when Jesus needed her the most? Nothing about Martha. It's Mary. Because she was attuned to the mind of Jesus because she sat at his feet attuning herself to the consciousness of Jesus. She knew what he needed. Jesus' death and resurrection. Who's the very first person that shows up that Jesus presents himself to? It's Mary Magdalene. Why? She sat in the silence, listening and attuning herself. And she heard the voice of the Spirit that morning, go to the tomb. You don't understand it. Doesn't make sense to you right now. Go to the tomb. Why? Because she was listening. But she wasn't inactive. But she was first and foremost listening and attunement. And then Jesus sends her out. She's the first one, a woman, to proclaim the resurrection. Why? because she was listening. So do you see what I'm saying? It's not either or, it's both and. And we can choose the path of Martha and live a tortured life, never being good enough, never knowing whether we're really hitting the mark, complaining about people who aren't doing it right. Or we can sit at the feet of the guru, attuning ourselves to the wisdom, grace, and inspiration so that our actions are propelled by heaven. Mother Teresa, who did a lot of work, but she also prayed and meditated three hours every morning and outworked all of us. 
and prayed and meditated three hours every morning. And out of that prayer, she would say, I am just a simple pencil in the hands of God. Do you see a lot of anxiety in that statement? God is the doer. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that maybe has to get done through me. But I, the ego, is not doing it. I, the little anxious self, is not doing it. Something larger than me is doing it in me, through me, as me. That's the contemplative life. We're just pencils in the hands of God. So I just want to break it down as to how we do that. Like Mary, the priority is to sit at the feet of God and Guru. What do we call that? Meditation. Doesn't have to be three hours like Mother Teresa, although someday you may grow to one or doing it three hours a day. 20 minutes. Do your Kriyas. And just spend just a little time in that silence, in that stillness. And in that stillness and silence, God's inspiration and grace begins to percolate in us and through us. Think about this. What was there before the Big Bang? 13.7 13.7 billion years ago, beginning of material creation as we understand it. What was happening? Nothing. God's silence and stillness was all that there was. An ocean of shoreless stillness. No waves, no ripples. Everything that is, that is good, emerged out of the silence. That's what Mary was doing in the gospel, sitting at Jesus' feet so she could get her direction from him. All the good that we desire in the world, all the truth, beauty, and goodness bubbles up from that silence. So meditation. The second thing is, even if it's just a line or a paragraph, after you meditate, read just something from Yogananda, read something from Jesus, read something from a sacred scripture. Because the words that come from these great gurus, they're pure truth. You want to know the mind of God? Don't turn to CNN, don't turn to Fox. Listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to the Bhagavad Gita. Listen to the words of Yogananda. You get truth as to how to live your life and how to integrate silence and action. The third thing that we do after our meditation and after just, again, even if it's just one sentence, we make a choice. We make a choice to be the pencil of God in our hand, in God's hands. You can do it as a simple prayer. God, I will to be your instrument today. I aspire to be nothing but your servant. Even when I'm washing the dishes, even when I'm doing the most ordinary things, I do it for you. Let your light shine through me. My life belongs to you. When we make that commitment, we create a container in our lives that allows us then to be inspired. See, part of what comes out of this great silence is inspiration and guidance. But there's a force and an energy the force and energy of love, shakti, that comes out of the silence, then that gives us the strength to do what we're doing. So every day, the third thing we do is we make that commitment to just be an instrument. And I'm moving towards a close here. I want to read a quote from the Hiri Mahashaya, Yogananda's guru's guru saying the same thing here, bringing these two together. Exchange unprofitable religious, and I will add political speculations, for actual God contact. Clear your mind of dogmatic theological debris. I'll share a little story from Swami. 
He got here, he's really here physically. He got here Friday night and after I served him his marinara, we got talking. And I said something about my future lives. And Swami said, don't think about your future lives. Don't think about it. You may create karma that you don't want. Think about God. So exchange unprofitable religious speculations for actual God contact. Clear your mind of dogmatic theological debris. Let in the fresh healing waters of direct perception that comes from that silence, from that communion. Attune yourself to the active inner guidance. The divine voice has the answer to every, every dilemma of life. So let me get back to Mary Magdalene. And I'm not being critical. Maybe I am of Martha a little bit. We don't hear about Martha after Jesus died. Don't hear anything about it. About a hundred years ago, someplace in the Middle East, they found the gospel according to Mary Magdalene. She wrote a gospel about her experiences with Jesus and very mystical but do you, you get my point? Because she sat at his feet, attuning herself. She's done a lot of work for him. That's how it works. So I'm going to close with a quote from the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Quote, Henceforth, again, this is Mary Magdalene speaking. Henceforth, I travel toward repose, where time rests in the eternity of time. I go now into silence. Having said all this, Mary became silent. For it was in silence that her teacher spoke to her. For it was in silence that her teacher spoke to her. There's no dualism. Once we are grounded in God's love, presence, and we're hearing the teacher. Every action that we do is sacred and serves the highest good. The divine in me bows before the divine in each one of you.